Hello everyone, in this video I'll talk about interrupts, which is an essential topic for computers in general, which of course also includes microcontrollers. First, I'll explain the general idea of interrupts, then explain how they work for our microcontrollers specifically. So, let's get started. First things first, what are interrupts? The name is pretty self-explanatory actually, they interrupt your microcontroller. Most microcontrollers, especially the 8-bit ones like the one we're using, will have a single core. When I say core, I'm referring to the CPU. As I said before, microcontrollers are essentially small, low-powered computers, so microcontrollers also contain CPUs, meaning processing units. One core means the microcontroller can only handle one process, or one code at a time, so stuff like reading or monitoring changes while also executing another code is not possible. As an example, when playing a game, Think about how your computer is able to instantly react to your keyboard presses while calculating millions of variables and displaying them on your screen at the same time. There are multi-core microcontrollers, but most microcontrollers, given their usual jobs, are single core. They are meant to be low power and efficient, and high performance or speed is something commonly not needed by microcontrollers. Let's transfer that keyboard example onto our microcontroller. Say the microcontroller is constantly executing a program on loop and say that we want the microcontroller to react to a button press on one of its pins and do something like executing this function. How can we make this happen? You could put a code to check the state of the pin, to detect the button press inside of this loop. But there are a lot of problems with this. If your code is small, then sure, this might work. You could check this pin frequently enough that you can catch it when it's pressed. But what if the code isn't small? What if there are a lot of delays, like this? Then you'd skip most of your button presses unless you press it right when the microcontroller is executing the pin check. You could try to scatter this pin check around the looping code to fix this, but this is just not right on so many levels. If only there was a way to execute this button code automatically when the button is pressed. This concept is exactly what interrupts are intended for. Interrupts are essential for any computer in general, but they are especially important for microcontrollers since they allow for some very neat applications, though I won't go too deep into them. Also, don't confuse this concept with multi-core hardware. There isn't a second core that executes this program. The way interrupts work is that there is an interrupt controller in your microcontroller connected to your program circuitry. Imagine that it has an input like this. And whenever this input goes high, the microcontroller will execute a special instruction where it will automatically stop whatever it's doing and store the values it's working on along with its current program location somewhere else and jump to a predetermined location in its program. This location happens to be 8 for this microcontroller. This location is not something you can change, it's hardwired, and is referred to as the interrupt vector. It is the program location that the microcontroller will jump to whenever an interrupt occurs. Try to remember this interrupt vector term, I'll use it a lot. Again, it refers to the location where your microcontroller will jump to when interrupted. This action is the same as jumping to a function call, right? If we put our button press code in this location and make it so that the button press triggers an interrupt, we can execute this code whenever an interrupt occurs. Then, if you restore your values before you made this jump, along with your stored program location, we can continue on with executing our code from where we left off, just like a normal function call. Except this function is special in that it is written specifically for the interrupt, in the interrupt vector's location. This function is typically referred to as ISR, which stands for Interrupt Service Routine. Also try to keep this term in mind. What ends up essentially happening is that the microcontroller automatically calls this function whenever an interrupt occurs, or you can think of it as if the microcontroller is inserting this function in front of your main code, whenever your selected interrupt occurs, then removing it. So your microcontroller is still using its single core to handle this interrupt, but this way, this code only executes whenever it is needed, and never otherwise. This is a very powerful tool used in more ways than you can think and all the possibilities will naturally come to you the more you grasp the topic and make examples. Also, what if you needed to interrupt your interrupt code? Many projects do in fact need this, but unfortunately you can't. The only way to interrupt your interrupt code is to have another interrupt vector and the hardware needed to jump between them in your microcontroller. Older or cheaper PIC devices will most likely have a single interrupt vector which means if you have multiple interrupt sources, you'll have to put them in the same interrupt vector without the ability to have one interrupt the other. But most mid and high tier PIC microcontrollers have multiple interrupt vectors. For example, this microcontroller has two interrupt vectors. One is called high priority, while the other is called low priority. And as you can guess, the high priority interrupt can interrupt the low priority interrupt. That's a lot of interrupt. 
So for this microcontroller, you can only interrupt and interrupt once, as long as one is high and the other is low priority. You can actually turn this feature off and only have one interrupt vector for compatibility's sake if you want. Also, some of the higher end microcontrollers have a lot more priority levels that can even be user programmable, but I won't go into those. I'll just stick to this microcontroller for now. One more thing. I talked about sleep mode in the previous video, right? Sleep mode is a mode you can put your microcontroller into, which stops the execution of programs and drastically reduces the current consumption. If the program execution stops, how do you even restart the microcontroller? The answer is, of course, interrupts. Interrupts can wake the microcontroller back up, which introduces options to increase power efficiency, should you spend the extra time to implement it. Let's talk about how these interrupts are handled in this microcontroller, along with which registers are relevant for which application. This is the diagram given by the datasheet for the interrupts. I know it looks a bit complicated, but I'll explain it all, step by step. This is the end where, if a high signal reaches, it will wake the microcontroller up if it's in sleep mode. And these two are the ends where, if a high signal reaches, it will cause an interrupt to occur, which will make the microcontroller jump to the interrupt vector. If a high signal reaches here, the microcontroller will jump to the high priority interrupt vector, while if a high signal reaches here, it will jump to the low priority interrupt vector. Don't forget that a high priority interrupt can interrupt a low priority interrupt. You can see that there are a bunch of interrupt sources, most of which are from peripherals, like these ones. So when I say peripheral interrupts, I will be referring to these ones. Keep that in mind so you don't get confused. But across all the interrupt sources, one thing is common, which is that each source consists of three bits that are end gate combined. There are six bits in total that you need to be aware of to configure interrupts. Three of these bits are global, meaning these three bits configure all interrupts in a certain way, while the other three are interrupt source specific, meaning each interrupt source will have their own three corresponding bits. Let's get the global bits out of the way first. These are IPEN, GIEL or PEIE, and GIEH or GIE. If you're wondering why these two have two names, you'll understand in a bit. Let's start with IPEN, which stands for Interrupt Priority Enabled. I've said that this microcontroller has two interrupt vectors, which are high and low priority. And I've also said that you can disable this priority feature for backwards compatibility and only have one interrupt vector instead. This is the bit that configures that. But if you're a beginner, there is no reason to disable the priorities. This is mainly meant for companies or people that already have pre-built functions for older microcontrollers that they don't want to rewrite. Next up is PEIE or GIEL bit, which stands for Peripheral Interrupt Enable or Global Interrupt Enable Low Priority. It has two names because it can have different functions depending on the IPEN bit, which I'll explain further in the diagram. When the priorities are disabled, which is when IPEN is zero, this bit can be used to disable interrupt sources from peripherals, which mostly refers to the internal sources. Or, if the priorities are enabled, it can be used to disable the low priority interrupts instead. Next up is GIE, or GIEH bit, which stands for Global Interrupt Enable, or Global Interrupt Enable High Priority. This bit is kinda weird. It looks like it has two different functions, but it acts almost the same way for both cases. It enables or disables all interrupts globally. You would think that when priorities are enabled, it would only enable or disable the high priority interrupts, but when cleared, it disables all interrupts, including the low priority ones. The only difference is that it can't turn on the low priority interrupts on its own. You also have to set this bit to have them enabled. Now, let's talk about the source specific bits. Each interrupt source has three corresponding bits you need to worry about. There are two exceptions to this, which I'll talk about in a bit. These bits' names will start with the abbreviation of the source peripheral, followed by the bits' function. Those three functions are interrupt flag, or IF for short, interrupt enable, or IE for short, and interrupt priority, or IP for short. So, for example, the TMR0 here is the abbreviation for timer 0 module and the names of those three corresponding bits are TMR0IF, TMR0IE, and TMR0IP. The flag bits contain the actual interrupt signal, which goes high when a certain condition occurs. I'll show you some examples in the next video. The enable bits enable or disable their corresponding interrupt source. They are end-gated together with the flags, which means unless the enable bit is set, 
the interrupt won't go through, since if any of the inputs of an end gate is zero, the output will always be zero. This is why they are called enable bits. The priority bits configure their corresponding interrupt source as high or low priority. As such, they are only relevant when the priorities are enabled, otherwise they are just ignored. You can see that these interrupt sources are mirrored at the bottom. The only difference is that the ones at the bottom have their priority bits inverted before their end gate, while the top ones are directly fed through. Also, don't worry about this part of the circuit. This is what allows you to turn off the priorities. I'll explain them in a bit, but let me remove it for now to make it easier to explain. It should make more sense now and look a lot less like a spaghetti of connections. You can also see the line here separating the two parts, calling the top part high and the bottom part low priority. This is because if the priority bits are set, for the top part, the flag bit can go through if their enable bit is also set. But for the bottom part, because of the inversion, the output is zero no matter what, since this input is zero, so the flag bit can't go through. And the top part is connected to the high priority vector, while the bottom part is connected to the low priority vector. But if you clear the priority bits instead, the bottom flags can go through while the top ones will be unable to, meaning by changing the priority bits, we can direct their corresponding interrupts to either high or low priority vectors. By the way, these three bits for the peripherals are shown like this to make them fit the diagram. Don't forget that this term refers to the bits in a register. So for example, this term refers to the bits from 0 to 6 for PIR1 register. So the three bits for the peripherals are in these registers. If you look into them, PIR registers will contain the flag bits, PIE registers will contain the enable bits, and the IPR registers will contain the priority bits. Which means that this same circuit exists for each one of these interrupt sources, but they are shown as a group here so they don't take up too much space on the diagram. Now, as I said before, there are two exceptions to the interrupt sources having three corresponding bits that configure them. First is the int0 source here, which is an external interrupt. It can't be configured as low priority, hence it doesn't have a priority bit. This pin is always high priority, and you can see that there is no mirrored connection for it at the bottom part either. Second is the RB source here, which causes an interrupt whenever any port B pin changes state. For this interrupt source, you also have individual bits for each RB pin that you need to enable for them to cause an interrupt on state change, which is also stated at the bottom here as a note. Okay, now hopefully you're still with me. You can always go back and listen again, or pause the video to think about everything. Now that I've explained all relevant registers and bits, it's time to understand how this diagram works. I already told you the purpose of these AND gates. They are there so that you can enable or disable individual interrupts, as well as direct them to either high or low priority interrupt vectors. After that, all interrupt sources are OR gated together, so if any of the interrupts went through, the output of this OR gate will also be high. Don't be confused, they are OR gated together so the high and low outputs of the end gates here don't short when connected together. This just means that if any interrupt source goes high, these OR gates will also go high, so they are just there to combine them. The other interrupt sources are also connected together with OR gates, then both of them are further connected with yet another OR gate. Then this output from the low priority part connects into this end gate, the other input of which has an inverted connection from the high priority output. This is what allows high priority interrupts to interrupt the low priority ones. If this output is high, meaning a high priority interrupt is in progress, all low priority interrupts will be disabled. Now we have all interrupt sources combined, so if any interrupt goes high, these outputs will also go high, but before they are fed into the interrupt controller, they are fed into these end gates. Remember that we have bits to globally enable or disable interrupts, which is what these end gates are for. The global enable for high priority is connected here so that you can just clear it and stop all interrupts from passing through. As for the low priority part, remember that global enable for high priority also disables the low priority interrupts, which is why both high and low priority global interrupt enable bits are connected to the end gate here, meaning you have to enable both to have the low priority interrupts enabled. Before we continue, if any source causes an interrupt, the microcontroller will jump to the interrupt vector, right? You may have the question, then how do we determine what caused the given interrupt? The answer to that is through software, which I'll explain how we can do in the next video, so hold on to that question for now. Before I end this video, I may as well explain the priority disable circuit I removed previously. Here's the original diagram. 
When priorities are disabled, all interrupts are routed to the high priority vector instead, which is why the low priority circuit here is untouched. Instead, the combined outputs of the interrupts are taken and added to the high priority interrupts after some circuitry. Remember that IPEN bit is what enables or disables the priorities, which you can understand why by looking at these end gates. By setting this bit, you can isolate the high and low priority part, which enables priorities. But if you clear it, you allow the low priority interrupts to pass here, which are then combined with the high priority ones. And as you know, high priority interrupts dominate the low priority ones, so you will only have interrupts on the high priority vector. There is also this end gate in the middle. Remember the description of GIEL bit. When IPEN is cleared, it enables or disables the peripheral interrupts, right? Check out this end and OR gates here. If the IPEN bit is set, meaning priorities are enabled, this OR gate would go to high, which would feed 1 to this end gate, which would let this input to pass through. So the GIEL bit here would not change anything, meaning it wouldn't enable or disable peripheral interrupts. It would just affect this gate here, which you can also confirm by its description. When IPEN bit is set, the explanation doesn't state any changes on peripheral interrupts. Only when the IPEN bit is cleared, this bit turns into that functionality. If IPEN bit is cleared, you can use the GIEL bit to enable or disable interrupts from the peripherals. You may ask, why even do this? It's because this is how the older microcontrollers did it. Remember that this mode is for compatibility with older microcontrollers, hence it's done this way. I know that this might be a lot to take in for a beginner, but not knowing interrupts is like not knowing most of a microcontroller. You will definitely have to use it at some point, a lot. If you still can't get your head around it, that's fine. In the next video, I'll show you some examples along with how to code them, which should help immensely. But I'll only make examples for the external interrupt sources. I'll explain the other interrupts in their own peripherals this video in the future. And that's the end of the video, and thank you for watching. If you liked the video, you can always leave a like and subscribe, it's always appreciated, and I'll see you in the next video.